particularly violent reaction, um, we'd be safe in the case of this guy, William Morris. Um, he's somebody who's active kind of along the slash, you would say, the modernity, modernism slash. He's kind of in exactly that period. Um, he's an Englishman, um, actually very active in a lot of fields in his life. I think probably what he's most remembered for is his contribution to design now and to what was called the arts and crafts movement. Um, but actually that in itself is linked to a lot of his other beliefs and writings. He was also a novelist. He was also an essayist, political theorist. <clears throat> so why was he anti-modernist? He was anti-modernist because he disliked urbanization and life in the urban environment. And those things are the result, of course, of modernity. Uh, Morris was also concerned about the impact that these environments had on the souls of people. He recognised modernist abstraction when he saw it, you know, in, in, in the way that society was operating and that human beings were being abstracted. There was sort of, their souls weren't really important anymore. They were becoming like kind of cogs in the machine. This was a, was a, a concern of William Morris. He championed the revival of older style industry rather than fully automated mass production. He wasn't against industry, um, which is ancient anyway, and that's a uniquely human thing. He's pro-human. But this ancient thing had been revolutionised. That's what we mean by the Industrial Revolution. It's not the invention of industry in that time. It's the revolutionization of industry in that time. Um, and this revolutionization leads to more and more automated industry. Uh, and automated industry affects what you produce. So that's the link in with his designs, which are quite intricate. Um, automated industry isn't likely to be creating intricate prints. So the arts and craft movement is focusing on that type of design. It also has a kind of um, often organic sort of plant-based pattern thing. So it's it's looking to something that's kind of the antithesis of the modern urban environment, isn't it? So Morris puts pre-industrial style arts and crafts in focus. Another thing that's anti-modernist about him is that he praised past times. Sometimes he's called a medievalist. He'd say that alongside the improvements that came with the modern era, something of the human soul was left by the wayside. And he's about a kind of a rediscovery through sort of osmosis, through sort of practicing life as people in previous times did to like rediscover the human soul. That's that's a very important um, rationale for William Morris. So those things are, you know, the very famous for, for this figure, anti-modernist aspects of him. But he's also was a modernist because, firstly, he has confidence in a system very much so. Um, he proposes a utopia. It's in the form of a novel, and it is a novel, but it's kind of a treatise at the same time, and that novel is called News From Nowhere. Um, this is a sincere book. It's not a cynical book. Um, he has the modernist confidence in a system of living and governing, and that genuinely, if that's implemented, it will fix the world, or at least the parts of the world that implement it. Um, the utopia is uh, something that would be kind of trendy in sort of pure modernist thought. Um, what we'll notice and we'll see a bit later on is it's exactly that kind of thing that becomes challenged by the dystopia. But remember in this time a utopia it's not like we would look at it now where we would kind of see it in a tongue-in-cheek way. It is sincere. There are sincere people who propose a utopia and they mean that. Um, so his book is called News From Nowhere. And the book is called News From Nowhere because the word utopia means nowhere. Thomas More writes the book Utopia in the 16th century. And he calls it that because he's talking about an ideal society that doesn't exist anywhere in the world. So he gives it the Latin name, which means nowhere, utopia. Another thing that makes um, William Morris a modernist is modernist optimism. 
we talked about this utopian model. If you follow that, it will fix the world. He has that kind of optimism. That kind of optimism drives him to write that book. That kind of optimism drives him to experiment with sort of working uh, environments and societies. Um, the very fact that you try something out really comes from optimism. So that's William Morris, understandably still uh, a notorious anti-modernist, but actually also a modernist at the same time. Another, uh, say, very notorious character of the same era as Morris is our next anti-modernist, that's Friedrich Nietzsche, um, a German guy who uh, is most known, I think, now as a philosopher. Um, and bearing in mind, you know, philosophers, even of our own time, aren't really on the radar much. Just goes to show how particularly kind of famous uh, as a modern philosopher he, he comes down to us in history as. Um, it's a lot to do with this kind of force of character. He's quite a bombastic individual. Um, but, you know, he, he says things that, that people have found inflammatory, and that's the reason as well. So Friedrich Nietzsche, and he, I would say, absolutely would have called himself an anti-modernist by his own admission. Uh, so let's look at the evidence for him being an anti-modernist. Um, he's often pitched as an originator of post-modernism. It's not a phrase that Nietzsche used or would have understood if someone said it in his time. But So that's a kind of a backward-looking thing. But he's seen as uh, an originator of some of the thought behind post-modernity. His influential observation, called perspectivism, led him to declare that there are no absolute truths and that truth is relative. Now, this is a notorious notion associated with postmodernity, postmodernism. Um, and that's all I'm going to say at the moment. It, it is very typically associated with that. Um, uh, I'm not going to challenge that at this time. Um, and it's so notorious, in fact, that it can be thought of by many as the definition of postmodernity, postmodernism. Um, Nietzsche also was backward looking. So he wouldn't have called himself any of these other titles we talked about, but he would have called himself a classicist. Um, so a revival of one of the philosophical approaches of antiquity that he called Apollonianism, he would say is the remedy to the time in which he lived, uh, to modernity. And modernity needs a remedy, and that remedy is found in looking backwards. So that's quite an anti-modernist um approach and and, and uh, mindset. Now he didn't have a vision that improved all the world, not concerned with all the world really, He's, uh, but only with individuals <clears throat> of a type, um, Ubermensch, kind of overcoming people, super people, um, and the world as he saw it ought to be the playground of the Ubermensch. Um, Nietzsche isn't concerned with the general harmony of the world. It doesn't have a kind of uh, um, world-changing concern himself. Um, so those are the things that make him quite anti-modernist. But what are things simultaneously that make him quite profoundly modernist? Firstly, what we've mentioned already, modernist confidence. Um, he didn't stop at observations. He made declarations uh, with, a, with a particular confidence, I think. Um, he was very good, I think, at observing stuff. And then the temptation was really far too great for him to write, therefore, and then he declared things. But, you know, that's not just his character. That's something about <clears throat> the era in which he lives. That's modernist confidence. He, he, the system will back him up. He's confident enough to declare things. He's, he's quite typical uh, modernist in that sense. And then we also have modernist optimism. What he proposed, he believed, would work. And he held the conviction that a system can change the world. We're not looking at fix the world, but he does have the optimistic belief in a change to the world. Um, changing it for the better, as I've said, isn't necessarily a concern of his. But he's not pessimistic about a system. 
if it is his system. A belief in humans. So he does have a belief in um, the human, certainly. Um, although not all humankind. Um, because another of his notorious notions was that certain humans had outgrown God. Um, you know, that's also very notorious of him, I think. Doesn't often get maybe unpacked, but I think really the kind of hyperbole of what he's saying is that um, where there was maybe a kind of a need for God at one time because of the emergence of the Ubermensch, he's, he's become redundant. Um, and then in a sort of hyperbolic way, he's saying God is dead. Um, but that's a very quick way to kind of summarize something that's quite complex there. Um, <clears throat> so there's a belief in human. That's that's really quite profoundly modernist as well. Of course, alongside this belief of uh, the kind of superior humans that have now risen is a belief in the abstraction of the rest of humanity. So he definitely goes along with that kind of modernist abstraction, which, like I said, normally um, comes down to people. He's abstracted the rest of humanity. If they don't make the grade, they're just to be sacrificed. The ideal takes priority over any human or all humans. So anti-modernist, probably by reputation, really, um, but profoundly pretty modernist in, in a lot of ways. Um, OK. It's certainly a notorious character in really every sense in history, um, and including notorious as an anti-modernist, which is why I've included him, is Adolf Hitler. Um, and his place of birth is in what was the Habsburg Empire in um, Austria. So in what ways was Adolf Hitler anti-modernist? Um, firstly, he was against internationalism internationalist systems such as capitalism and communism. He had a great hatred for those things. Um, his own position was as a national socialist. That can be confusing in itself because normally we speak of socialism as something that's positioned on, on the left wing of politics. Um, that's because socialism taken on its own is people focused. It's sort of of the people is what socialism means. The word before that is very important in the case of Adolf Hitler, national socialism. So this isn't a thing that's for the benefit of all the people. It's something that's for the benefit of a nation of people. And even by that, he doesn't mean anybody who resides in Germany. He means uh, a very precise kind of ethnic historical Germany. So that's what kind of makes Nazism actually far right thing instead of a left wing thing and again that's probably a bit too brief an explanation look into that a bit more okay <laughs> if, if you're interested um so what else makes him anti-modernist he despised modernist culture notably the visual arts but also music and literature all those things of course modernist art all those things incorporated international influences so i suppose it makes sense that again that he would despise that um, as many people do, he tended to view modernity as something that only began when he noticed it and when he disliked it. Um, people still kind of do that with when they um, throw around phrases about cultural epochs today, actually. And Adolf Hitler did that. Um, and that means he doesn't really recognise things, um, actually, proponents within modernity that he did very much appreciate, like Richard Wagner. Richard Wagner certainly was a musical innovator um, in the period of modernity. Um, but because he liked Wagner, he and he disliked the term modernist, he would absolutely separate those two things. Um, like Nietzsche, the idea of the good of all was nonsense to Hitler. One race among the world's races was the world's natural dominator. So, obviously, he's not internationalist in a lot of other senses, but he's not um, he's not concerned with being a sort of world scale fixer. You know, um, obviously, these things are very well known about his ideology and his belief. So, 
those things make him pretty anti-modernist. Um, he would very proudly have owned the term anti-modernist. Um, what things actually also make him quite modernist? Um, there are certainly things that do that as well. Firstly, he's a modernist optimist. He believed in a new world order that was achievable. Secondly, while despising the representation of abstracts and abstraction, actually he very much modelled modernist abstraction because he abstracted people. Um, we may just assume this in terms of the people he was prejudiced against, of which there were many, um, because that's typical behaviour of prejudiced people, that they dehumanise people from a target group, they, they speak of them in abstract terms. But actually he showed towards the end of World War II that this abstraction extended to Germany. He was willing to sacrifice real Germans en masse for the protection of the abstract German. He even spoke of it costing the life of every German if necessary. So nothing demonstrates more the full abstraction of Germany in his mind. Even if there's no living German left, there is still the conceptual Germany. That's the thing that, in fact, he believes in and protects. That's an abstraction of people. Okay, so we'll move on to someone else who probably wouldn't be as hostile if we start questioning how anti-modernist he really was. Um, quite so safe area with an intellectual here, Aldous Huxley. Um, so as I've said, um, really probably more broadly remembered in history as an intellectual, but more precisely as a novelist. Um, he, his most famous novel is what we're going to be speaking about um, as we examine him, the novel Brave New World. Still a, a big seller, still read by very many people and um, if I can provide a very quick review, please do read it. It's a, it's a very interesting book, and as with all of Huxley's work, it's very well written. Um, but review over there. Okay, so why, why was Aldous Huxley anti-modernist? Well, because he writes a famous critique of modernist ideals. Here we have it. His famous novel, Brave New World. This is a critique of modernist ideals. Remember, with William Morris, we have a sincere utopia being written. Huxley comes in a time a bit later um, where there is very great questioning of that type of sincerity, confidence and optimism and that's really what births a book like Brave New World and we call this a dystopia. Um, dystopias I think are something we're quite used to in terms of um, still books but also films, TV series um, they're kind of born around this time. The most famous dystopia, uh, another example for you here, by George Orwell, 1984. I'd say that's probably the most famous dystopia, and that's also an early one from this same period. But it is a few years later than Aldous Huxley. Actually, Huxley has written that previously to George Orwell. Um, so, a rise of a dystopia obviously means a lack of confidence and optimism and sincere belief in modernist ideals. So yeah, and within Brave New World, this is mostly really the document of um, proof of his anti-modernist stance. Um, he is a critic of the abstraction of human beings as well. Um, he differs to William Morris because he doesn't think that if you get the right system in place, um, human beings won't suffer and they won't be abstracted and their souls aren't going to be kind of left by the wayside. He doesn't have that kind of very sincere and optimistic belief that William Morris would have had a few decades before. He's writing a dystopia, not an utopia. Um, so yeah, he's a critique of the abstraction of human beings. Don't want to spoil Brave New World for you if you're going to go on to read it, but that's absolutely a theme through it. And he doesn't share an unquestioning optimism and faith in technologies. Again, that's definitely a theme in Brave New World, but a bit of a spoiler if I went into too much detail there, but you're certainly going to see that expounded throughout the plot of Brave New World. So his very famous, most famous novel, 
is something that really demonstrates that he is, a, at the very least, a someone who critiques um, modernity and modernist ideals in a time where they're still active. That's what makes him an important individual in that regard. Um, so, in what other ways is he actually a modernist? Less famous ways, but also ways that are absolutely on display to us. So, while he does write a dystopia, Brave New World, he does write a utopia. Near the end of his life, this is the novel, oh dear, I can't get you the front cover there. This is the novel Island. So he's actually, it does get to a point where he's being William Morris, he writes what is it? Basically reads as a novel, but a lot of the time more reads like a kind of a treatise um, where he's proposing a whole load of ideas, a system for a community that is a good community. Um, and if it was followed by the rest of the world, the world would be fixed, effectively. So it's there. Um, so he does hold the belief that a system could exist that would heal society and the world. Actually quite a modernist um, in exactly that regard. So in Brave New World, um, it seems on the face of it that Aldous Huxley critiques the use of drugs because in Brave New World there's a drug that um, in this sort of futuristic society everybody's encouraged to routinely take called Soma um, and it's he's not encouraging it in his narrative it's it's critiqued um, but he actually encouraged and promoted the advantages of other drugs he also writes I happen to have that as well. The long essay called The Doors of Perception. The Doors of Perception is partly about his own experiments with LSD and mescaline, and it's partly kind of promoting the use of LSD and mescaline to say, like, well, this will be a good thing. That ultimately, uh, society could be better if, if um, the use of that type of drug. Um, routinely was harnessed. So what's the difference between Soma and mescaline and LSD? Um, well, it's really just the type of drug. So he's not anti-drugs and he's not anti the sort of the intervention of a modern technology of, of drugging. Um, Soma is a panacea. So Soma disengages people. That's kind of the point really of Soma. Um, people can't maybe sort of rest on their own anymore so they have to take soma so that they sort of have a kind of a mental time out it's a panacea is what you would call that type of a drug whereas um, mescaline and lsd enhance so they sort of increase your perception they make you engage in the world around you instead of disengage so that's why you know, he looks like he's contradicting himself. He would say, well, he isn't. He's not anti-drugs. He's just anti the type of drugs that make you disengage. He's actually very pro the use of drugs that make you engage. And he's actually pretty famous for that as well. Um, and those drugs, LSD and mescaline, they do originate from a natural um, chemical that's found in a particular type of cactus, but they're artificially developed and he himself promotes the artificial development of them. So he's not anti-technological innovation and he's not anti-technological um, solutions. So there you go. We've had our anti-modernists who are in fact also modernists. Um, I think I'm going to call this video Modernist Anti-Modernists um, just to intrigue people if nothing else. Um, uh, and there's some examples of them there. So that kind of shows how complicated actually using the term modernist as a noun, as a descriptor, is to say, well, was this person a modernist or definitely anti that? It's actually a much more complicated situation once you once you come to look at it.